What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to another episode of Lockdown Badgers. The transfer portal has begun for Wisconsin. They lose a player. We talk about that. Plus, what can we take out of spring practice that isn't an overreaction? We're going to talk about all that and more on today's Lockdown Badgers. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Locked On Badgers fans? Welcome to another episode. Thank you so, so much for tuning in, as always, as we build this community. Thank you for making one of your first listens every day. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Uh, we're bringing Justin into the show. Uh, we got the fire behind me again. We're going to do another ambiance show today, Justin. It's the second one. Um, yeah, we'll just mix it up. Big news on the basketball side. We talked about it a lot. Season's over. Transfer portal madness has begun for Wisconsin. Um, Jordan Davis leaves the program, enters the portal. I don't think in a, a shocking move. Um, I'm curious your take on on his his departure, where Wisconsin goes next. Played 20 minutes per game this year, five points per game, 3.5 rebounds. Never could figure it out as a shooter, though. Yeah, I, I don't know what to make. Like, here's the first thought that I have off of this is the one reserve piece we have that actually deserved minutes. Got it. I guess Gilmore would be the other. Um, but this, this means we have to find people through the portal that can fill spots. And, and maybe they thought that he was going to be gone regardless, but we have to find talent to fill in. Like they have to find guys. So now you have five points per game that's gone that you need to fill. And, Ideally, you're finding somebody that can fill for more than five points per game in 20 minutes. So mm-hmm. you need to find that guy. You need to find somebody who's willing to be either a high-end reserve or a starter who's going to push somebody to the bench and get away with that. Like this, it's it's such a difficult thing to look at from a psychological standpoint because the way I look at this is you have to figure out a way to not alienate the guys you have on the team already but yet find guys that are going to be better players than what you have without creating waves that end up blowing up the nucleus of your team. Yeah, it's a great point. It's the discussion we had with Longo and the quarterbacks, right? How do you bring in all these quarterbacks and not have it become like an internal division? You have to preach uh, competition. You have to preach culture, locker room. You're going to get your chance. Best person's going to win out. Um, I want to tell a little bit of a harsh truth on on Davis. And I, I wish, again, I think we we are unanimous in this. Wherever he goes, I hope he crushes it. Like yeah. I hope he has a, a great career wherever he goes. He played hard for Wisconsin. Yeah. And he was he became a really good rebounder off the bench as well. Like a good rebounder. I thought he handled, because he was a starter. Connor moved into the lineup. I thought he handled that really well, really mm-hmm. professionally. I think Wisconsin can do better. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, it's really hard to have a reserve off the bench that shoots 30% from three doesn't create shots, isn't getting to the rim. Um, and quite frankly, isn't an elite defender, you know? So I, I, I just think Wisconsin can upgrade at that spot. So I think it's probably win for both programs are both parties. Yeah. Davis can go somewhere. Where he can be a starter. He can play more. I hope he absolutely crushes it. Oh yeah. I think Wisconsin can get better production production from their seventh man off the bench. Oh, I agree. I think I wouldn't be shocked if he goes down to a mid-major program and averages 10 points a game. Like that'd be great for him. I'd love to hear that he did that. I'd love to hear that he he reaches his potential. You know, the shooting percentages pop up a little bit. He gets more confident in this game and he becomes a nice player at the mid-major level. Or even if he finds some place in the power five, that's an, ends up being a good spot for him. Um, Wisconsin can do better. And we, we've talked about it, the roster as a whole. Like, there's not a difference maker on this roster. And part of that is that Connor is a freshman. Um, but there's nobody that I look at and say that I can look at this guy game in and game out, and he is a guy that is going to be a, a stud on this team. And that's kind of where we're at. Like, it's a, there's a lot of one step forward, one step back guys where they can be great for two or three games in a row and then have three games in a row where you're like, uh, they kind of just didn't show up. Yeah, you need more players you can count on. I uh, 100% yeah. agree. Uh, this is from Not a Whale. Does this mean Connor is staying for sure? Who's the next one to transfer out? I, I want to address the first question really quick, Justin, because I did talk to somebody connected to the program. I, I don't know for sure with Connor, but I can tell you I, I don't think he's leaving from just a conversation I had. I think you have to look at these. with When it comes to the transfer portal, you can't connect one to the other with anybody. 
Like it, saying somebody's staying does not mean that somebody else is going to stay. Saying somebody's leaving does not mean that we're going to see a mass exodus. Now, there are teams that we've seen that with, like Minnesota. We've watched them over the last couple of years with both programs, football and basketball, and players have just been leaving in droves from those. Um, Wisconsin, it could happen at. I, I tend to lean on it if that if that's happening. If we see a, three or four guys transfer out that are actually producing, it tells you that there was a broken locker room at that point because there was something behind the scenes that was happening that if all these guys decide that this isn't working and I need to go somewhere else, that there's problems internally. And I don't know if we saw that. Like the way the guys played, they played hard still. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, th- I think there's a potential for – a few more pieces to move out. I would not expect a mass exodus. Um, who, as as for who is next, I think we're waiting on Tyler Wall's decision. Yeah. I think that's a big linchpin to see where this program goes. If he comes back, it changes the the outlook. Justin, I want to go here too. So <clears throat> I want to get your take on this. And if you're in the comments, I want to get your take on it. Right now we're at 13 scholarships. We're at the limit. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's just start there. We're at 13 scholarships. That's counting the class coming in. Mm-hmm. So I know Wisconsin is definitely adding in the portal this year. Right. And we've talked about it before on the show. You can very easily take a couple in-state kids, move them to an NIL deal. This is something we talked about weeks yeah. ago yep. um, to create space. How many transfers does Wisconsin need to bring in this offseason? I think, they, I need think two, yeah, they need at least two. I would like to see three. I think you need to do what you can to redesign this team. Um, and that means, like, ideally, I'd say in a perfect world, I'd want to see a starter and two high-end reserves. And by high-end reserves, I mean guys who average seven, eight points a game. That would be great bench work to get two guys that if you combine, you're getting 16 points off the bench from. Those are guys that if a starter goes down, I can slide them into the starting lineup and we may not be quite as you know explosive as we are, but we're there. And that, that starter ideally is a guy who's averaging like 12 or 13. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not going to be easy to find. That's a guy who's borderline – potential of everything goes right for him is an all conference type player. So you, if you're getting that level of guy, you need to sell your butt off to get it. You're, you're going to have to, and you may have to have a hard conversation. With one of your current starters. Well, let, let, that leads into the next question, right? Let's say, let's say Tyler Walt, let's say everybody else comes back and maybe over transfers. Maybe you lose another bench transfer. Maybe it's a neath, whoever it is. Yeah. All the starters come back, right? You bring in a high level transfer. Who are you moving to the bench? Justin. Well, a lot of people keep talking about Klesman. I disagree with that. Mm. I, I actually think that he he makes so many winning plays that I would like him on the court. But it's hard because I look at it, and it's, if it's a backcourt player, he's the easiest guy because Chucky projects most as a true point out of the group. So you can't take him out. Even mm-hmm. though I think you and I both agree, Chucky's game is probably better as an off guard. Like he's just he, a better shooter from that spot. The problem is, though, he's an undersized off guard. Yes. He is. That's the problem. Um, and Klesmet can play some point, and he's probably the best penetrator we have. But the, it's it's a really it's difficult because there's not a big gap between any of them. But I feel like people view Chucky in a different way, in a different light than they do Klesmet. And I look at Klesmet, and it's like, but man, he does so many nice things. If he was more aggressive, like if he was a guy that like the games where he plays really aggressive on offense, if we had that guy all the time, Klesmet's in the starting lineup no matter. Mm-hmm. He's he's a guy you look at, and he's probably averaging 13 a game, and shooting at high levels and making high level plays. Um, yeah, I, I know I'm not really answering the question, but you I would top. probably say Klesman is probably the guy. I think Con- if Connor takes a step forward, he's going to be the best player of the team. You can't but move if, Connor. Connor's yeah. like the one obvious one you can't move to the bench now. Yeah, so it's either you're looking at Chucky or Klesman, and at that point you got to go with the guy. You, like Chucky has to be the starter just because he's the point guard. Can I also say the the kind of on said thing? Klesman's already transferred once. Yeah. Like, yeah. So you have you have some something there to hold right? over like, his head. I, I don't I, want to I, say hold it over his head, but it's you you yeah, this is this is the nature of college basketball in the era we're in, right? You have to weigh decisions based on who who has easier routes to transfer out or transfer in. The fact yeah. is Klesman's an in-state kid, he's already transferred once. The NCAA has already said they're gonna make that second transfer more difficult. They don't want they don't want constant waves of transfer. I think you could move Klesman to the bench. I think he's the answer, even though I don't. He know is. He, he is. I just, of the guys that are out there that I watch and see make the most, the, that are problems in games, Klesman isn't that guy. 
Mm-hmm. Like he is not the guy that is that is losing games for us. And and Commandant Clink threw this up there. And listen, I it's not that I don't think that he would he should be a reserve. I think ideally he's a like on a national title type team, he is a super sub for you. He's a guy who comes in and it instant offense, nice defender and does all the other things. It's more that the composition of this team, he his attitude and his leadership is something that I think he needs to be on the court more. Um, he's probably a guy who needs to play starters minutes, even if you put him to the bench. So he's yeah. he's going to pick it up because he's going to play probably the point and and shooting guard or off guard. But yeah, that's pr- he's he's probably the guy. But you have to you have to massage that ego a little bit and be like, hey, you're still playing starter minutes. Don't worry about it. You're going to be on the court. Well, I want to bring this comment up here um, from Bo Dragon. Klez made made all the clutch shots this year. Without him, they lose three more games at least. You you could come off the bench and still be the finish in the finishing yeah. lineup. So I yeah, I, he was a big time player in those minutes. I think they would have him in that situation, but that doesn't mean you need to start him. It could be a little like Manu uh, Ginobili for the Spurs. Always came off the bench, but he always finished games. Uh, we had a comment up here from Rio earlier. At least three kids. We need a point guard, a wing, and a big. I agree. In an ideal world, that's what you need. Um, but scholarships are – I don't know if you can create, carve out three more scholarships <laughs> unless somebody leaves. Well, and the type of players matters too, and it's it's where what we're being connected with scares me a little bit because we're not – nobody that I've seen mentioned with Wisconsin is up, upping the athletic profile of this lineup. And it's that scares me because if you have a good team that's athletic and a good team that's, you know, average or middling athletic athleticism – they're going to struggle to beat the good team more times than not because there's going to be those those 50-50 plays where athleticism wins out in games. Mm-hmm. And grit matters, but if both teams are playing hard, you're going to lose because you're less athletic. We've seen it before with Wisconsin back when we had some of the Bo Ryan teams against North Carolina. They were We were the less athletic team. We'd win by eight points or whatever because there were those tipping point plays in the game where Wisconsin just couldn't make the play because they were less athletic. We need to find guys. And I, I agree with Evan Taylor. Until we find out that Evan Taylor is truly linked to Wisconsin and is a guy that's coming in, I, I'm hesitant to say that that's a guy we're going to lock down. Kind of in the same way that uh, Antonio Reeves went ended up at Kentucky last year. Like There was talk that we were hot on him. And we had a couple last year. up there. Yeah, we had a couple last year that we were in on and didn't finish. Uh, Commandant, I agree with this point. Starting doesn't really matter as long as you have seven good players. It matters only in the sense of culture and locker room, yes. in my opinion. You have to be able to manage egos. I actually think guard is pretty solid at that for the most part. Uh, outside that crazy, weird Alondo Tucker year, which we've talked about that. Um, we got to take a very quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk some spring football, get to more of your comments. The big thing I want to talk about with Justin and, and get your take, what can we actually take out of spring football? Where we, you know, we don't want to overreact to things, but what can we actually learn from it? We're going to talk about the next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, today's show is brought to you, as always, by our good friends over at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. There's a reason we use FanDuel. And if you sign up now, you get that no sweat first bet, $1,000 bonus bets back. Get some free swag, get some free cash in your pocket if your bets don't hit. Use it to stock up on some Badger gear, like I got in my background. Um, or buy some Suns gear. Listen, they're going to the finals this year. I've talked about it. Durant's back. They're four zero with KD. Um, get on that Suns Bucks uh, conference or that Suns Bucks finals. You get plus six fifty. Forget what the Bucks did last night. It's a regular season aberration. I still think they're coming out of the East. I think the Suns are coming out of the West. Um, get the the free Fanduel sportsbook app. Safe, secure, super easy to use. Parlays, same game parlays, combine points, rebounds, assists, steals into one game for more excitement, bigger payouts. Do it responsibly, but have a lot of fun with it. Don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on today to learn more. All right, let's get back into this uh, great conversation with Justin. I promise you we're going to get to some more of your basketball comments here at the end, but uh, let's talk a little spring football as well, Justin. And we also we do want to mention uh, we have this in our third segment, but Wisconsin men's hockey uh, mm. hired a new coach. Again, that is just yeah. not my sport. I apologize, y'all. Same here. It sounds like it's a home run hire from what we've heard. I don't know enough about hockey to say one way or the other, but I love hearing that people are very complimentary of the hire. Yes. It's Wisconsin program. When people talk sleeping giant, it's an overused term. Wisconsin hockey is a sleeping giant. Like that is a, if it has a stud coach at that spot, they are a national title contender year in and year out. And the women's team has proven that. 
Yep. And it's Mike Hastings. He's the coach at Minnesota State for the last 10 years. Uh, multiple conference coach of the year awards. He's won the conference the last couple of years, been to the Frozen Four. Again, I am now stretching the limits of my hockey knowledge. Yeah. I did. I will say this. I got a text from somebody who who does know some inside uh, program information, and he said home run hire. So mm -hmm. um, it sounds great. We'll go from, we'll go from there. Uh, let's, let's talk spring football. Um, Justin, one of the things I want to talk about, because every time I do a show, whether you're on here or someone else is on here, I'm talking about spring football. I always say, well, let's not overreact to this. It's just, it's just spring. But I think there are some things we can take out of spring football. And one of the ones I wanted to start with, I'm going to kick it over to you. Then I want to start with, you can take schematic talk out of spring football. Yeah. When you start hearing Greg Scruggs, the, the defensive line coach say, Hey, we're going to play more five tech instead of three tech, meaning we're going to spread our defensive line out more. We're going to put them in situations where they can disrupt the line of scrimmage more. Then you hear James Thompson Jr. say the same thing. We're going to be more disruptive. We're going to be on the edge of the tackle. We're not going to be on the edge of the guard. Those are things you can take out. And to me, that's an exciting change because Justin, for 17 years, that's, that's hyperbole. But I feel like for the last eight years, every single year, the defense line has said, we're going to be more disruptive this yeah. year. Gonna, and and nothing like, comes no, of it. Not. Because the coaching staff isn't changing, well, they're not going to be more disruptive. Here I'm is about that change. Here is my concern with that. If you're going to spread the line out wider, you have to fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. And does that mean we're sending our linebackers, our middle linebackers, downhill? That means you can be had over the middle, mm -hmm. unless your safeties are incredible. So, I'm not against it, but I I need to see it because it does scare me a little bit when it, when we hear like the the middle of the line might become a little bit more. Easy, easy to work against with the run game. So we'll see how it we'll see how it plays out once we see it going. But I do like the idea of the defensive line being more disruptive. I think that from what we've heard, that's where Fickle likes to see his pressure come from. And I think we're going to see a difference in the type of guys we start bringing in for the defensive line. It's going to be more athletes, guys that they think can be disruptive because Cincinnati, that's what they did. They had guys who were pass rushers on the defensive line. It was not a hold the point let the linebackers flow. It was a, you guys attack, the linebackers are going to fill holes and we're just going to basically create a line and hope that everyone does their job. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned this too, everything's a trade-off, right? Like if you want to, to your point, if you want to maybe create a little more space on the defensive line, get more pressure, you are opening yourself up more to more uh, potential inside runs. You have to change your scheme there a little bit. Everything's a trade-off in, in sports. Um, Let's talk receivers here a little bit. Uh, something else that I think we can take out of something that you mentioned was we were just talking before the show. I think we can buy the Pauling hype. Yeah. And I was already high on Pauling when he transferred over. I made an initial predict prediction that he would be our slot starter. Um, but the speed is checked out. He's getting rave reviews from everybody that's seen him. Brady Collins raves about him. I think we can buy that hype. That's just it. And that's why I think that it's legit is the fact that we're hearing it across multiple parts of the offseason. He's, he's winning the lifting sessions. So he's proven that the athleticism and, and physical tools are there. And now we're hearing it in camp that the production is there. So when plays are there for him to make, he's making those plays in practice and he's making highlight plays. And we're also hearing that he's getting reps in with the, the first team. And that is, that is where it's a big deal. That means that he's pushing enough that he instantly is now a guy that they're like, okay, we need to see kind of what he can do if we throw him in with this group. Um, I think he's a legit guy that there's there's a very good high chance that he's our slot guy to start the year. Um, mm -hmm. I am with Wisconsin running a traditional three wide set. I think that's a lock. Like he's he's the fastest receiver we have. He's the most elusive probably until at least until Tretch gets on on uh, on campus. So you have a guy who projects in a way that Wisconsin really hasn't had since what Brandon Williams. And Aaron he wasn't, yeah, yeah, but he was never he was never really used. No, no, I say that in jest because I'm yeah. salty. He never really yeah. got. But yes, I, I hear your point there. What about um? What, I'm going to kick it over to you because I kind of took the first two segments there. What what's something from spring that you feel concrete about talking about here? Um. Well, you and I talked about Chris Brooks. And I kind of look at him right now, and I, it's, we're in a wait-and-see mode with him. Like, there's people that probably think that he may be a guy that we need to look at. I think we need to see a little bit more. When he, we start hearing that he's getting first-team reps, um, then I'll start to believe the hype on him a little bit more. But as of right now, the receiver room is so stacked that there are guys in that room that it may just take a little bit longer for them to click. Like, 
the Keontas Lewis type guys, the, you know, the guys who have massive athleticism that may just take a moment for mentally for it to snap into place before they just start dominating is what we need to kind of see here because we're three practices in. Well, where are we at when we hit practice 12 is kind of what we're, what we need to know because a lot is going to change in the next couple of weeks here with guys stacking practices. And if suddenly we have guys turn on the afterburners and their development within the scheme, then we're going to see things really kind of get jumbled up and move around here. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with the defense. Like right now we're seeing the guys who have the most experience for the most part. It's we need to see what they do with the guys who are still kind of get feeling it out that are younger guys that are kind of letting their athleticism start to fall into place and making the, the mental plays the way they're meant to be made. There's going to be some changes. We'll be, we'll have a surprise starter somewhere. Yes. Yep. And you know, the ancient Robert Swartz and um, Chris Brooks also getting hyped made the catch of the day yesterday. You know, it, the interesting thing to me with Chris Brooks jr. There's two things. He was getting some hype at the end of last year with a different mm -hmm. staff. Um, he's getting some hype this year, very early in spring. But the biggest thing to me is he's a different body type, right? He, he can bring something to the receiver room from a physicality standpoint that no other is, frankly, no other receiver can, except for maybe Marcus Allen, if it clicks for Marcus Allen. Like, that's the only other guy that has – Tommy McIntosh is tall, but nobody else has the type of build that Chris Brooks yeah. has. And you can use that build. You you mentioned it before the show, Red Zone. Yeah. I mentioned it on a third and six. Like, that's the type of guy you can get inside on a slant, just box somebody out and get eight yards, right? So that's where I'm intrigued with Chris Brooks. He yeah. brings a level of physicality to the spot. Yeah, I compared him to Noah Brown before the show, mm -hmm. former wide OSU wide receiver. And that's a huge guy that can basically just abuse corners in, in certain small areas. Um, a lot of his catches, he's making huge catches where he's going up over guys. And that, as I call it, the Shaquille O'Neal, I'm just get off me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this play. Mm -hmm. Those are really hard catches to make. That's why it's like, it's easier to see the guys who have speed and can separate projecting because it's like if you can create that separation, the catches are just easier. So Agreed. if he can if he can do that, then yeah, he'll have a definite shot at being a guy who jumps into that top group. But if if it's going to be like making those hard contested catches consistently, there are going to be guys on this roster that are going to be capable of creating more separation, and that's going to be where he he may be more of a situational guy. Doesn't mean yeah. I'm not high on him. I think he could be great in short yardage situations and in goal line where he can just do things against corners that nobody else on the roster can do. Can I tell you the, the first thought I had? And Kyle Kramer says, listen to every pod, first live show. Let's go. What's up, Kyle? Thank you for jumping yeah. on, my friend. I really do appreciate it. Um, the, my, the first thing that jumped in my head with Chris Brooks is funny when the coaching transition happened. He might be the only receiver that's like, oh, come on. I'm a run blocker. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm here. Yeah. But it sounds like he's uh, made a great jump. I just had that funny thought in my head. Um, we're going to take a very quick break. Friends of our show, come back. Bunch of comments we're going to get to. Um, some more basketball comments, football comments. Let us know in the comments if you're watching the show right now. What do you think we, you can take out of spring? Um, what is something you feel good about saying after a couple practices, knowing that most of it's just overreactionary at this point? Mm -hmm. All right. Really quick break for our friends of the show, and then we'll come back on with more of your comments. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Lockdown Badgers. Really do appreciate it. We got Justin on as always. Justin's always a great guest. A lot of people, Justin, you get some nice comments in the YouTube section, by the way. Um, people praising your intelligence, which I have I've never done. Well, that's a first. I'll but, take uh, it. <laughs> let's get some comments up here. Um, a lot of these are off YouTube shows previously. Again, I always try to get your thoughts back up in here. This is one's from Rio C. I thought this one was interesting, Justin, because I mentioned on a previous show, I I've mentioned several times I don't think Greg Gard should be fired. And I've mentioned several times not making the NCAA old tournament is a failure of a season. Yeah. So Rio said, so you're okay with two failing years in five years. You only consider back-to-back -back years as stacking failures. I want to really quickly address this and kick it to you, Justin. Um, I, and Rio, you might even be in the chat. So if you want to follow up on this, please do. I'm it, To me, it, I need a trend in my opinion. And we don't have a trend of, of stacking failures because we won the Big Ten last year. I know some people don't care about that as much as I do, and that's totally cool. All right, I'm never going to tell anybody what they need to care about. But I haven't seen a trend of failing years, and that's really where I'm at when I'm evaluating Greg Gard as a coach. I'm different with this because a record yeah. to me is somewhat meaningless. Like I look at a team and I want to know what they what they are capable of by looking at what I see on the court. 
in the last two years, like we won the title last year, but but I look at it and you and I agreed with this last year while we were watching the team. If you take Johnny Davis off that team, that is a it's basically what we had this year. Like there was there were there were a lot of things that we didn't love about the roster composition outside of Johnny Davis doing Johnny Davis things that were like, this guy's amazing. And you can't take that away from him. He had that, he brought that in and he developed that. But there are some disturbing trends in terms of what we what we're developing. Like we we talked in a previous show about what Bo hit on in terms of his recruiting, in terms of the the, the guys that he had that were high level rotational guys, whether they were starters or bench or whatever. And we we looked at it and he was hitting at something like a 75% clip, 80% clip with the guys that he brought in. Like everybody ended up adding value to the team. And that's where we need to, I need to see it with this team. We see teams when people talk about, well, Kentucky and North Carolina don't make in whatever, whatever. The issues with those teams is they have tons of roster churn with NBA and everything else you're constantly working to try and create chemistry within a team like that. Whereas Wisconsin doesn't typically have that level of churn. So you shouldn't have the chemistry issues that you're fighting through. It's more of a developmental thing where it's like, do we have the talent that can take the next step and get us back to where we need to be? Now I need to see consistency with that, where the, the roster is capable of reaching high level of play. And what that means is I don't want to see a team that can just make the tournament and maybe grind out a win or two. I need to see a team that if we get a sweet 16 against a team that's like an Oregon team that's athletic, that we don't look like we don't belong on the court. And that's where I, it scares me with what I've seen lately is we're we're facing a team, a good team that has athletes away from getting bounced every year in any tournament. Yeah, again, this is where I think we disagree a little bit. So I, I totally get your point, though. I think your context is really, really good as usual of what's the ceiling? What can this team actually achieve versus what they did achieve? I think that's kind of where you're going. And I... But I actually think last year's team with a healthy Davis and Hepper not getting hurt could have made a run. I know it's ifs or buts or candy and nuts. Like you can't always do that. <laughs> but like that's also not Greg Gard's fault that his two best ball handlers got hurt, right? That just stinks. And um, I know we say, well, if we, Davis wasn't on that team, what are we? But Davis was on that team, to your point. Like he yeah, was on. No, I agree with you. That. know, so I don't know. I. I'm just not there yet, uh, but I did want to address Rio's question. Let's let's jump in a couple more because we could talk about well, that. I, I want to make one more point on that. And you are right. the The only issue I have with the Davis, with people that fall on Davis, is I I, I like the Davis being brought in. Like that's a type of player that I want to see Greg Gard target more often. Target the guy who is a little bit more raw in terms of being a finished product, but has that high level athleticism that he if he clicks. That guy's a difference maker for you. A lot of these guys, if they click, they become a nice player on a team. I want to see the guy that if if the athleticism comes together, that guy is capable of making plays that you're not that nobody else on the team can make. Yeah. No, I, I, they do need to bring. We but we both agree there. Yeah. They yeah. need to bring in some higher upside players, some athleticism that you can develop. Yeah, 100 percent agree there. Um, this one's from Leroy James, switching up a little bit. He said, every year I hear about how good the offensive line could be. I think he's just in a wait-and-see mode. Justin, are, is the line going to live up to this recruiting hype this year? Short answer, I think it will. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be because the way the offense is going to work is going to make it much easier on them. Now, it's going to come down to how they pass block. But I think the run game, will we'll see a huge leap because if you get those line, if we can stop linebackers from just run blitzing all the time against us, the run game gets substantially better overnight. Like those, we saw this in the past where I think teams were more hesitant to run run blitz against us with some of our earlier teams, like the early like 2010s, early 2010s. They wouldn't send linebackers quite as much. And what would happen is we would get three, four yards of carry. Well, mm -hmm. once they started blitzing those guys, those those carries went to zero or one yards if they were if it was a defense that was solid in its fits. So there just wasn't a hole there. Your guys are running into the back of the line. Well, if things open up and the linebackers are are staying honest, we will see guys make plays because they're going. Like if you let if you let Braylon Allen get ahead of steam, he's gonna he's gonna plant yeah. a linebacker. Like that's that's just going to happen. Like if that guy is not coming at at Braylon Allen full bore, it changes everything. And it gives it like that's probably early in the season. It's going to take a couple games, I'm sure, before it happens. You're going to see run blitzing yet to start the season. 
just people need to get I don't used know if to you that. Are. I don't think running. you are with Longo. Do you think gonna, so? You think it will be instantly? Yes. It, w- it will be a little bit different, I think, because we're not facing Big Ten teams right off the bat. But I'm when we see a Big Ten team early in the season, I could see them pl- try to play that unless unless Longo starts throwing for 350 right yeah. off the bat, which is which is going to happen. Badger fans need to get used to that shock because there mm-hmm. are going to be there's going to be a game in the first three where we throw for 300 yards. It's oh, going more. to happen. Yeah. Like I, 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 I know I know it will be more, but I'm just saying like that is like that is the like 250 was like considered a great passing day for Wisconsin before. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's an incredible day. There's going to be a 300 yard passing game in the first three games, and people are going to be like, "Oh my, this is crazy." Yeah, I just think through formation, Longo is going to dictate that they're not going to be able to he run will. as much. Like, oh yeah, that, well, we've talked about that last mm-hmm. year. Like, spread things out, make it harder to put linebackers in the middle and just let them run. If you spread them out and go three wide or four wide, you're forcing those linebackers to have to play, not sit in the middle and just shoot gaps. But Bones we never Reagan really did that. Especially salty today, by the way. Paul Chris can make the 94 Cowboys offensive line look bad. That offensive line would never look bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like you're so salty, man. Can, oh. can we go back in time and just put Barry Sanders on it and watch him run for 2,500 yards in the NFL? That's true. Uh, Scott Francois says uh, talking football is much more exciting than talking about the basketball team. Yeah, we're all hyped for it. Yeah. We all are. Now, basketball is about to make some moves in the portal that we are going to have to talk about. And, you know, we'll, we'll cover both. We always cover both. So, uh, we'll probably wrap it up there again. I, I I try to keep them around 30 minutes because I feel bad if we take them longer than that. A um, bunch of comments I didn't get to again. Let's let's end on a couple really good comments here, though, because I really do try to get everybody's thoughts into the show. We're better because of it. Um, this is this is a good one from RR. Ryan Herring's an American hero. I agree. Yes. Do we, need, do we need to get that song, the, the Greatest American Hero? Oh, man. No, thank you, R. Believe the it or not, Ryan's walking on it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I am certainly not that. Um, here's a good one from Ethan Stark. Maybe finish here. We'll finish up on basketball. I honestly think men's basketball team needed a vocal leader. This is something I want to talk to you about. Brad Davidson, that, that's the biggest thing we missed from him, right? Like, I don't think we had anybody on this team, especially early in the year, middle of the year, where – you could just yell at people and get energy well, going. And Klesmet started to become that guy later in the season, but I later think that he was worried about stepping on toes earlier in the year. Like mm-hmm. I, I just don't think most of the other guys are are that type of leader, and that's fine. But I think this team needs that guy. Like there needs to be somebody that's kind of yelling at people and being, you know, getting their heads right. In do we do we agree that next year Klesmet from the jump is probably that guy, and that alone is a big difference? Yeah, I think so. I, I think he really comes into himself next year, and I wouldn't be surprised if he takes a, goes up a notch or two. And you're sending him to the bench, Justin. <laughs> no, I know. I you forced me. <laughs> it's a tough decision, man. That's what I'm talking about. Like, because let's just take that a step further. And I know I said we we're going to end the show, but if he's the leader on your team, if he's the vocal, emotional leader, you can't put him on the bench. I know. I agree. And that's exactly part of the reason why I say it. Like, he makes so many winning plays. It's why you look at the guy and it's like, I watch him out there and it's like, that guy, he will go get it done for me. If I say I need a turnover in this game, Klesmet's the guy I'm I'm looking at that I think will make a play. Like, mm-hmm. and he's such a good defender on the ball. Like, mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Which, which then means, let's take one more logical step. If we're saying you can't move Klesmet to the bench, right? And we already had the discussion that he's the only guy, if everybody comes back that you would move to the bench, then then just logically follow this train, right? Then you're recruiting in the portal for guys to come off the bench. Yeah. Which which can still make a difference when you consider Carter Gilmore was potentially our top reserve this year. So yeah. that doesn't mean that it's an apocalyptic scenario. If you I think get, let me let me just finish this really quick. If you get a microwave scorer off the bench, like a guard who can come in and, and microwave score a little bit, and a reserve big man, a better version of Chris Vogt, let's say, but not a starting big man, that team is already better. It does. It's not the ceiling you want, but it's better. Yeah. Well, it's it's better. But see, this this is where I think I differ with some Wisconsin fans. I struggle with. I don't want that to be considered a victory simply by making the tourney again. I want to see us aspire to what we were aspiring to under Bo Ryan. Like it does. I'm, I'm. It doesn't have to happen in the same way. We don't have to hit twenty straight years, you know, of going to the tournament. But it needs to be. We're, we're building towards like our goal is to be we want to make a deep tourney run once every four years. And if if that's what it is, if we hit an elite eight or like a, a mm-hmm. really competitive sweet 16, 
where we look like we belong with the top teams in the tournament where it's just a if, if things fall a certain way if things can go that's that's what I want to see that's the type of team that I want to see us put together and I think that if we if we just find some reserves that get us back in the tournament that's not going to happen um but see that so for me the issue is I don't want to see us make an excuse and say well we're back like I want to see, I want it. I don't want it to be like, well, we're going to put that to bed. We still need to look at it and evaluate it and say, are we, are we trying to truly pushing for what, what some people aspire to? You and maybe to that's transformation next year. Huh? You need to see a big transformation next yeah. year. Yeah, I, I need to see us like, and maybe it's maybe it's a power forward or maybe it's a center, but I want to see some bringing a starter. Like I know, I you know maybe. One of those two guys has to prove it. Like I love Crawley had some really great games this year. He also had some games that were complete stinkers. So I, I don't want to get caught up on his NIT production. I want to get caught up on the games that really truly mattered against really good teams. Was he putting up 15 and 10 against Kansas or whoever else we were playing where we truly need him to be exceptional because that's mm -hmm. where it matters. Like putting 18 on Minnesota, whatever, you know, that's, okay, I, I, any guy on the starting rotation could put 18 on Minnesota. It's going to be an interesting offseason, Justin. Yes. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, Big Apple Bucky said, Mike Hastings, hockey hire. You need a show on that. So we talked a little bit about we don't know hockey, uh, but I do <laughs> want to put this out there because I do want to do a show on it. I think it's incredibly important. We talked about Granada when he was fired. If there is a hockey person that really knows the sport that's in the chat or sees this, yeah, DM me. Here. Yeah, and I would love to quarterback a show with someone else providing insight because I'm never going to blow smoke and talk about things I don't know. But I would love to do a show on it. I think it's a big hire. Um, for the most part, I don't talk about things I don't know. Yeah. For the most part. <laughs> anyway, uh, on Wisconsin, we definitely want to talk about that big apple bucky. Uh, but someone needs to reach out to me who's more of a hockey person for me to make that happen. Otherwise, I would just be kind of rambling. Uh, let's finish there. Justin, as always, thank you. We're at 37 minutes. Um, I apologize for some of the comments I didn't get to, but I try to loop them into future shows, so I'll try to do that as well. As always, DM me, reach out to me if you have any questions. If you want to jump on a show, if you have any suggestions. Um, and with that, on Wisconsin. Justin, we're going to talk again probably in the next couple of days, I'm sure. Sounds good. Let's go.